Good evening and welcome to worship at Patchwork Central. Our worship being done, of course, through Facebook Live, through this virtual medium, instead of being here together in person, uh, but we are uh, gathered here in spirit. So I wanted to, uh, first of all, I'm going to take just a few moments and let's let people get on uh, the video and join us, and then I'll start out with a little bit of an introduction. I'm hoping to um, maybe do things just a little bit differently tonight, and hopefully it uh, will enhance the experience for people, but I'll explain that here in just a moment. I'm going to get on, on my phone so that I can see comments and things coming in. told my mic might not be on, so give us a moment for sound. <laughs> now, let me see if it's on. I think I pushed it in. Okay. We, th we think we have it, but we're going to test it here just a moment. So... So once again, welcome to Patchwork Worship. Once again, uh, I, I am John Rich. I'm one of the members of the Patchwork community. And for those of you who don't know, um, when we do this worship in person, as well as virtually online, uh, we do it on a volunteer basis. So people sign up uh, for a few Sundays or even one Sunday or however many they're willing to lead. And then that person puts together the worship service, sometimes with help uh, from other folks and leads that service. So even though I am a, an ordained minister in a particular tradition, uh, I am not the pastor of Patchwork Central by any means. Um, we are all ministers in our community, in our worship community, and so uh, that is uh, one of the ways in which uh, we are community together, is that we do act as pastor and minister to one another, and no one is considered the, the pastor or the minister of Patchwork Central. Um, so it looks, looks like we have the audio uh, difficulty fixed. So as by way of introduction, um, because we've been getting just a little bit of feedback on these virtual worship services, um, I want to go ahead and at the beginning here, invite you to go ahead and in the comments section, um, make yourself be known, just say hi, say your name if you wish, um, but if you want to have things uh, to contribute during the worship service as I'm doing it live, um, please uh, put in prayer requests, put in uh, gifts that you've had over the past week or however long, put in um, announcements for the good of the community. Uh, you don't have to wait for that part of the service to just put those in the comments section. Uh, I will try to keep track on my phone and I will try to incorporate them in during the service uh, as, as they come in. So be, because there is a lag between the time that I'm actually speaking these words and the time that you're hearing them could be anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple of minutes. And so I don't want to be sitting here with two minutes of silence uh, you know, before I get a prayer request. So off, just off the top, if you want to be putting things in the comments section, and like I said, I'll do my best to keep an eye on that comment section and, and incorporate everything into the worship service as it flows. And kind of connected to that, because patchwork worship is often a very conversational worship service. It's a very conversational, spiritual time for us. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation through the comment section or through our uh, email, uh, email, our email list, or however you want to do that, uh, if you have questions on any of the material I've presented uh, during my word section, if you have questions, your own comments, disagreements, even disagreements are wonderful. We can have um, some really great theological uh, discussion and even debate in a spirit of love. So uh, please uh, put that in there even after the worship service is over with, and I'm happy to uh, go back and check those comments and respond to questions uh, and uh, keep the conversation flowing. So I'm uh, trying this just a little bit differently, but I hope this gives you an idea of the spirit of the worship service as I'd kind of like it to flow just a little bit better. Um, 
So uh, we already have prayer requests for Nelia, and I do have, uh, so we will have that. If anyone has an update on Nelia, I would appreciate that. The last I heard on Nelia was Friday. Uh, they were back in the hospital because of fluid uh, in her lung, and um, the hospital there was unfortunately pretty busy, uh, was what I heard. So if you have any updates since Friday morning on Nelia, please go ahead and share that, and we'll bring that up during the prayer section. Um, all right, so I will be able to flip through these during the, during the relevant sections. So, welcome to Patchwork Worship. As we often do, we gather ourselves by uh, sharing our names. I think many of you have already done that, uh, but if you haven't done that and wish to do so, please add your name in the comments section. That draws us into a spirit of community saying, we are here, we are present, and uh, we are one with another in this community. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for being part of our circle. Uh, and we also have celebrations um, coming up. We have uh, July 2nd uh, on the calendar, it looked like, is Karen Hughesby's birthday. So on the 2nd, happy birthday to Karen. Um, this is uh, Rowan's 16th birthday. So I assume that means today. So today is... Uh, 16th birthday for Rowan, 16, big, big birthday, so that's wonderful. Also, uh, 4th of July is coming up this week, and that is the Queen of Norway's birthday, as well as there's some other holiday on the 4th of July, I forget what it is, uh, but, but the Queen of Norway's birthday is July 4th also. Um, so those are some of our celebrations. Let me just make a quick look here, see if we have any, other, any further celebrations, birthdays, anniversaries, anything like that. All right. So we'll get started then. Um, as many of you know, if you've been watching for the past several weeks, I've been doing a series on the plagues from Revelation. And of course, I was inspired to do this because we're currently living in a pandemic. But as I delved more deeply into the text, I realized that this doesn't really have anything to do with a literal plague like a pandemic. The plagues in the book of Revelation, like, the, like all of the book of Revelation, are highly, highly metaphorical and spiritualized and uh, sort of dreamlike in their language of the subconscious and the unconscious. And it melds and combines lots of different images and narratives uh, from the Hebrew Bible, especially from the story of the Exodus uh, and the prophets, from uh, the current, for them, the current political situation in Rome, combined with uh, images and beliefs about Jesus uh, and who Jesus was for them in that in that early or in that first century, uh, late first century, early second century time period, uh, as well as the natural world, natural phenomena that they saw around them, and their understanding of the connections between the natural world and the spiritual world. So you've got all of these things mixed together in a kind of a coded language that's meant to be somewhat secret to keep. Uh, to keep the full meaning out of the ears of uh, the Romans and out of the ears of those who would persecute the early church, um, as well as all of these other things just mixing and mingling together. Yeah, um, oh, and we have, sorry, uh, Tom, Tom North's birthday, July 7th, so quick, quick shout out to Tom um, in, the, in here. Anyway, so... With that little introduction uh, to, Re to Revelation and to this idea of the plagues, if you've been watching for the past few weeks, I've been talking a lot about these. And then tonight we'll be talking about the fourth and fifth plagues in uh, the book of Revelation chapter 16. So here's the description from Revelation 16 verses 8 through 11. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch them with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores. 
and they did not repent of their deeds. And may God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of the word. So the burning question, no pun intended, at least in my mind, is why? Dear God, why did these people not repent to make this pain and agony stop? They were being scorched with the sun. They were suffering sores and boils on their bodies. They were even under this thick darkness that was so oppressive and suffocating that they were gnawing on their own tongues. How could they keep cursing God's name under these conditions? It just seems to defy logic and not in the usual way that the book of Revelation defies logic. And part of me is just a little bit in awe. I mean, that kind of devotion to evil is like supervillain level. I mean, it takes a lot of commitment to all things malevolent and vile to put up with that kind of pain and suffering to keep cursing God's name. So now, removing my tongue from my cheek, the good news of this passage is that repentance is is always possible. God is patient, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. John of Patmos says in his vision that even with these fourth and fifth plagues, the the fourth of scorching heat and the fifth plague of darkness over the whole land, the people did not repent and they continued cursing the God of heaven, but that means they could have repented. Repentance was still an option, a possibility. And that means that these plagues are not functioning solely as punishment, but as a wake-up call for repentance and transformation. And I think that is good news, because even though we have some very gory details and some very stark descriptions of the suffering, at the bottom, at the heart, at the foundation of this scene and and of the whole book of Revelation, is that repentance is always possible, even at this late hour. So these plagues, in some ways, echo the story of Job. Because in the book of Job, God and Satan make a bet. They make a bet over how much suffering Job will endure before cursing God's name, just as these followers of the beast continually curse God's name. So in the book of Job, you have God and Satan hanging out up in heaven, I'm not going to get into why Satan's hanging out up in heaven. There's a whole book on the history of Satan and and all of that. But anyway, God and Satan are hanging out in heaven, and basically they make a bet. And they say, and Satan says, look, Job is only being good because he's not suffering, because he has uh, all this wealth and this wonderful family. Um, You know, things are going great for Job. Why why wouldn't he uh, keep going with this? And God says, no, 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 my servant Job is pure and upright. He would never curse my name. And so Satan says, no way. So so God says, no way any amount of suffering causes my servant Job to curse my name. No way. And Satan just replies to God, Yahweh, and and proceeds to uh, make Job endure all kinds of suffering. Now, Job endures this suffering, but he does not do it silently or with a good temper. He gets angry. He gets frustrated. He hurls some pretty sharp, sarcastic barbs that probably even stung the creator of heaven and earth. But even with all of his frustration and his anger and his sarcasm, Job never actually crosses the line into cursing God's name. Even when his own wife tells him he should, quote, curse God and die in Job chapter 2 verse 9. So here in these visions of plagues in Revelation, we have almost the opposite, almost this comical reversal of Job. We hear that these followers of the beast are being scorched with fierce heat from the sun, that they have sores and boils on their bodies. The empire is plunged into darkness, so much so that they're gnawing their tongues in agony but they they continue cursing God's name. They have faith. They have faith in evil, and they have faith in injustice. And that faith is not wavering, just the way that 
Job's faith in God stayed uh, despite all of his trials. So it's this almost comical reversal of these people who have such faith in evil, such faith in malevolence and injustice. So then the fifth plague. The fifth plague is the bowl poured on the throne of the beast and it plunges the kingdom into darkness, and it reminds us of the ninth plague against the Egyptians in the story of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 22, it reads, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, so that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was dense darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. So this plague of darkness in Revelation is centered, quote-unquote, on the throne of the beast, which is, of course, the city of Rome, which is the center of the Roman Empire, the metaphorical throne of the Roman Empire's power and authority. And this plague of darkness is deeply ironic because the Romans saw themselves as the light of the world. The one of the most famous orators in the history of Rome, Cicero. Cicero once wrote, This city, Rome, is the light of the whole world and the citadel of all nations. The light of the whole world and the citadel of all nations. So in John of Patmos' vision, Cicero's statement gets reversed so that instead of the city of Rome being the center of all light in the world, it becomes the epicenter of this oppressive darkness in the world. So I want to pause here and say that no one ever really thinks they're the villain. We all cast ourselves as the hero, whether it's individually or our community or our city or our nation. The Romans believed that Rome was the light of the world, but of course, to the early Christians and to a lot of other people, Rome was the epicenter of oppressive darkness, injustice, and evil. So how do people get so confused, so mixed up as to which side they're on? I think part of the answer is, you know, none of us is as good as we think we are. We're all sinners. We probably read these passages from the book of Revelation, if you've ever read them before, and read about plagues of scorching heat and deep darkness and all of this, and you know, affecting these followers of the beast, these evildoers. And if you're like me, when I first read this, I had sympathy. I had uh, pathos for these people. Poor souls, if only they would repent. But we always think of those people as those people. It's never us that are the evildoers. And I think John's, John of Patmos' original audience would have been the same way. They assumed that they were the heroes of the story, the oppressed minority in the Roman Empire. And many of them were, but probably not all of them. There would have been wealthy Romans in their congregations. There would have been government officials and aristocrats, possibly new converts. Maybe not many of them, but some. But many of those followers of Jesus in those Christian house churches probably did not realize the extent of Jesus' message of liberation for the oppressed and good news for the poor. So imagine sitting in one of those early Christian house churches. There would be a mix of people all around you. Now, in typical Roman society, you did not socialize with people outside your group, either above your level or below your level. Aristocrats were served by slaves. They did not eat meals with them. Government officials like procurators and consuls did not rub elbows with merchants and tradesmen at least not socially. Women definitely did not fraternize with men unless it was their husband or a very close family member. 
You had your place in society and you stayed with those people and you didn't socialize outside your circle. Except in Christianity. The early Christians taught that everyone was equal. They taught that everyone should sit at the same table and eat together. And this would have been unheard of for probably 95% of Roman society. So there you are, in the late first century CE, sitting in this house. Maybe you're a peasant farmer. Maybe you're a tradesman. Maybe you're a government official. Whoever you are, you're sitting in that church. Maybe you are a Gentile convert to Christianity. So maybe you were raised, grew up, worshiping these pagan gods and idols, keeping to your own subset of society. And that would have been life for you. That would have felt normal. That would have felt like the way things should be. This new equality in the Christian community would have been very strange. It would have been very hard for you to get used to. And you would have had questions about, does God really think we're all equal? I mean, does God love the lame beggar who can't use his legs, wears dirty rags, and has to eat moldy scraps of food? Does God really love that man as much as the wealthy aristocrat who has a lot of money and gets to wear fine purple dresses and dine sumptuously in his palace every night? What kind of God would see those two men and think they were equal? But that's what you're taught. That's what we are taught, is that we are all equal in God's eyes. So in that house church, when all of you from all of these different social and economic backgrounds are mingling, you're sitting maybe and listening to the leader read this book of Revelation. And you might think to yourself, those poor souls who refuse to repent, they're the ones following the beast. But after a little thought, maybe you realize, well, maybe not all of the followers of the beast are outside the Christian community. After all, there would have been converts, there would have been Gentile Christians, there would have been people who probably still bowed down to idols, even if they were just play-acting it, because bowing down to the idol meant you didn't get arrested. It meant you got to stay with your family. It meant you got to keep doing whatever business it was that you were doing. It meant that you got to keep your neck. So maybe people were doing that just to survive and just to keep their families together. But that's not what the book of Revelation says about conquering the beast. To conquer the beast and its image, the idols, you have to not bow down. You have to not worship them, even play acting. So that would have created some real tension, I think, in these early Christian house churches. I'm just checking. So let's go back and talk about why these people who were suffering in this vision in the book of Revelation might have continued to suffer and not repent. Because there are different ways of overlooking our own sin, of not seeing ourselves as the bad guys, as the villains of the story. One way of overlooking our own sins is just that our individual transgressions we never count as, as important or as damaging as other people's transgressions. I think this is simply human. Our memory does not cling to our own sins as tightly as it does to the sins of those who hurt you or someone you love. Or you can justify your own sins saying that you did a lesser evil in service to a greater good. Or maybe that even though, yes, you, you committed a sin, but you're really a good person at heart. And that's not as bad as someone who intends to do malice 
or someone who is an evil person who, do, who commits a transgression. So there are all of these ways that we can overlook or minimize or justify our own individual transgressions while heightening and dramatizing the sins and transgressions of others. A second way that we do this, a second way that we kind of kid ourselves, fool ourselves into believing that we're better than we are, is not really seeing the complicity that we have with sinful systems and structures. You see, it goes like this. We tell ourselves, well, I don't enslave anybody. I don't kill anybody. But, but, I still buy goods produced by slave labor. I still, buy ta- I still pay taxes that buy bombs that are dropped on innocent civilians and kill them. The buyer is sibling of the butcher. So we may not think that we commit any active sins of killing or enslaving or these, or these terrible things, but we are often complicit because we support the systems and the structures, the economies and the political systems that do commit these sins. And so none of us is ever 100% perfectly and without reservation a conqueror of the beast. All of us have some level of complicity in supporting the injustice of the evil empire, and that is sin. And so those ways of overlooking or justifying or minimizing both our own individual transgressions as well as the sins of the systems of which we are a part and in which we are complicit lead to this deep spiritual confusion, this confusion of not being able to recognize which characters we are in the story. In John of Patmos's vision, I know when I first read it, I, I just assumed, without even thinking it consciously, I just assumed I'm one of the conquerors, and other people are the ones being afflicted by these plagues. But that reflexive assumption, that unthinking assumption, is also sin. Because too often when we read Scripture, whether it's Revelation or another part of Scripture, we think of ourselves on the wrong side. We think of ourselves as the Israelites, but never the Egyptians. We think we're on the side of the Rome, or we're on the side of Jesus, never on the side of the Romans or the religious officials who persecuted him and eventually put him to death. We think of ourselves on the side of St. Paul after his Damascus Road experience, never as being on the side of Paul before, the side of Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the early Christian community. Often it never even crosses our minds to think that way. And so I go back to my original question. Why did those followers of the beast not repent? They were being scorched with fire and afflicted with sores and covered in darkness so thick they were gnawing their tongues. Why did they not just repent and stop cursing God so that their pain and their suffering would stop? And I think the answer is twofold. Number one, why am I even talking about them in the third person instead of the first person? Why am I talking about them as a they instead of including myself in that group? And the second part of the answer is, of course, that the people in that group, myself included, don't see themselves as sinners, don't understand themselves as followers of the beast. They think that they are the conquerors. They think they are the followers of Jesus Christ. And of course, it's never so simple. You're never one or the other. You're always a mixture. But to think that you're consistently on one side when obviously there is a lot of the other side mixed in to your thought and your actions and your behaviors and your words is sin. So we need to have the humility to examine the depth of our own sin. We need to take 
an honest look at ourselves, at our personal transgressions, but also at our complicity with systemic sins and injustices. And so we need to start reading these biblical narratives and understand that we are as much the villains as we are the heroes. We have to look at our own selves and our own lives and understand that we have racism within us. We have patriarchy and homophobia and ableism baked into our psyches and our behaviors because we were raised in the empire. We were raised under that throne, that throne that called itself the light of the world, but is in fact a center of darkness. We need to confront these insidious sins within us. And it is not an easy process. It is painful. It is more painful than a terrible sunburn. It is more painful than festering boils on our skin. It is more painful than a darkness that causes us to gnaw out our own tongues. And I think this is part of the point of John's vision in the book of Revelation, is to say these painful things, as painful as this sounds, people are still lying to themselves People are still seeing themselves as the hero and not the villain. They're still seeing themselves as the followers of Jesus and not the followers of the beast. And so, so John is saying that work of introspection, that work of honest self-evaluation and self-awareness is more painful than these plagues. But it is necessary if we truly want to follow Jesus, if we truly want to be the children of light, if we truly don't want to be the followers of the beast, then we have to engage in this painful work. And so, even at this late hour, repentance is always possible. That is the good news. No matter how late we come to the realization of our own sin, repentance is always possible. God always welcomes us. God always wants us to start doing that hard work of introspection and self-awareness and turning away from that life. God always wants us to do that and is always ready to welcome us when we do. And when we do that, then we truly will be these conquerors of the beast, the ones who live for God's empire and not Rome's empire or America's empire or any other earthly empire. And so I invite you to start doing that hard work. I know I don't like doing it, but if we do it, and maybe even if we do it together, then we will overcome, and we will be victorious, and we will be conquerors. Amen. Just checking the phone again any other, for any other additions. Jane Johansson caught my little Yahweh pun. Thank you for catching that. I don't know if everybody did. So now we move to a time of lifting up prayers for God's people, and if uh, I'll wait a few moments uh, if you want to type in in the comments section uh, anybody that any individual or group uh, or situation that you want to lift up in prayer, uh, I'll have a few moments of silence. I'll check the comments section again, and then I will uh, I will pray, and everybody is welcome wherever you are to join in this prayer.
Okay, if you'll please join me in an attitude of prayer. Dear God, we come before you humbly, acknowledging that we are sinners, no matter how much we try to fool ourselves into thinking otherwise. We know that we have committed our own transgressions and that we have been complicit in the transgressions of systemic injustice. We know that we do not deserve to approach you, and yet we do. As your children, knowing that you love us unconditionally, knowing that you always welcome our repentance and our desire to turn away from sin and evil and to turn toward you, to turn toward your empire on earth. We ask you for healing for those that are sick and in pain. This evening, we especially ask for healing for Nelia and for her lungs and the fluid in her lungs, as well as for her heart and its rhythm, that the doctors and nurses may have wisdom and that they may find the source of the problem and treat it effectively. God, we lift up the family and friends of two neighbors of Karen's who were killed by violence on Chandler recently. We ask that you work in the systemic injustices that lead to violence, that lead to people being able to get their hands on weapons that can kill in a flash, Systems that lead to people being so desperate that they will kill out of anger or greed. Because, God, we know that these things do not happen in isolation. It requires entire ecosystems of deprivation and despair and access to be able to cause this level of violence. And so we pray for repentance and transformation on every level, from the individual, to the neighborhood, to the city, to the nation, to the whole world. God, I ask prayers for Natasha. She asks us to lift her up in prayer for whatever reason that she needs to feel your presence and needs to know your power. We ask that you make your presence known to her. We lift up in prayer Lauren and Diego. We lift up prayers of gratitude for Peggy Pirro. We lift up prayers for all of the woke people who strive to find a way to help, who strive to understand that they're not as woke as they think they are sometimes, but to humbly keep moving forward, to keep working at it, keep trying, that every time they fall down or make a mistake, they keep repenting and turning back, we ask that we be such people. God, all of these prayers we lift up to you in your holy name and for the sake of your reign of love and justice coming to earth, your empire, rather than any human kingdom. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Now we come to a time of sharing gifts. We have the bowl on the table symbolizing the acceptance of gifts. And of course, uh, we will still accept financial gifts uh, to help Patchwork uh, continue being uh, present even during this very difficult and very strange time. Um, So please keep sending in uh, your financial contributions and those will continue going toward the good work that Patchwork does uh, here in the community. But we also want to know gifts that you have received. And so as we prayed, uh, we know that uh, Sean lifted up Peggy Perot and gratitude for her. I believe I know the situation for that. Peggy is helping Sean to refurbish a lamp that was originally made by Lucian Nicholson, who was uh, part of our worship community several years back and a wonderful musician and artist. Uh, and so gratitude and uh, Peggy Perot as a gift um, helping Sean to 
uh, to uh, rehab that gift of Lucian's. So multiple gifts in there. Um, looking for other gifts. I know, I believe the rain was a gift uh, for those who have gardens or just those who like to see uh, the green things growing. It was good to have some rain recently to, uh, to water, that, water our plants. And after the rain, we had some nice weather today, so that was also a gift. Uh, Jane Staten lifts up the gift of visiting children uh, and Grandy. Uh, so wonderful having Jane Staten's uh, family in town and uh, her grandchildren with her. Uh, so that is, that is indeed a gift, and we celebrate with Jane on that. Gail lifts up the gift of the zoo is open and the animals are wonderful and the social distancing is good. Uh, so an outdoor event uh, that is relatively safe and fun for the family and uh, um, good for animal conservation also. So, uh, so the zoo as a gift. Any other gifts? Well, please continue writing them in the comments and we can continue uh, enjoying one another's gifts. So now we come to the time for celebrating communion, and I will lift up yet another gift. Darlene made yet another just gorgeous loaf of bread. I don't know if you can see from this distance, um, but it is a sort of a conch shell, snail shell uh, shaped loaf of bread. Uh, it is absolutely gorgeous. It smells of peanut butter and chocolate, um, and of course Darlene knows that that's my personal favorite com uh, flavor combination in the whole world is peanut butter and chocolate. So uh, a gift even to me personally, as well as a gift to all of us to get to see Darlene's wonderful art. Uh, another gift real quick to lift up. Paula lifts up that uh, daycare opens up on the 6th uh, and her husband gets to go back to work. So uh, daycare opening up and uh, people who get to go back to work uh, both indeed are gifts. Uh, so thank you, Paula, for joining us and for, for lifting up those gifts uh, that we can all rejoice with you over those. So coming to this table, I invite you to uh, get whatever communion elements you have handy. Uh, if you have some kind of bread or a cracker or something that you want to use as your uh, communion uh, food, as well as a cup with some kind of drink, whether it's uh, wine or juice or milk or water, uh, whatever you have uh, in a cup uh, that you want to use, because we are spiritually together. This is a meal that is to be shared together. And so uh, I invite you to do this, even though we are physically distanced, uh, that spiritually we are all at the same table, uh, and we enjoy uh, coming to this table with each other. So in those early days of Christianity, like I said, the Romans had a very stratified society, had a very a society full of boundaries of who was in and who was out of particular groups and cliques. And they didn't know what to make of these Christians and their weird ritual called the Lord's Supper. And there were some Romans who were detractors of the meal, of the ritual, and they would spread rumors that these celebrations were somehow cannibalistic, that Christians would sacrifice real humans and eat their flesh and drink their blood. Other detractors made up stories about the Lord's Supper being these massive orgies that were debauched and carnal happening along with their suppers. Because in the Roman mind, the Christians' flouting of their social boundaries was considered bizarre and dangerous. Because, you see, slaves ate elbow to elbow with their masters. The poor and the rich ate the same food. Prostitutes and aristocrats dipped their bread in the same cup. This would be considered unusual even by today's standards, but in the Roman Empire, it was downright unthinkable. And for the Romans then, it wasn't that much of a stretch of the imagination if these social boundaries were being broken so easily by these Christians. Why not cannibalism? Why not mass carnal profligacy? 
If these Christians believed that their Lord and Savior offered his metaphorical body and blood for them to eat and drink in mystical union with them, then why not believe that these Christians would eat literal flesh and drink literal blood? If these followers of some ex-rabbi from Nazareth, which is who knows where, experienced a spiritual intimacy with each other even though they were from wildly different backgrounds, why not also believe that they were sexually intimate with each other, with everyone in that community? The meal marked those early Christians as weird, as different, as strange, even as dangerous. Dangerous to the social boundaries and the social system of stratification that Rome had set up. This meal should mark us in the same way. It should mark us as different. It should mark us as strange. It should mark us as the risk to the status quo, as a risk to the social inequities and injustices of the world around us. So we must make this meal a part of our rejection of the earthly empires, of our rejection of thinking that people are more important or less important than other people because of their wealth or their status or their power. This meal is us rejecting false social boundaries. Through this meal, we enter into a spiritual unity with each other. Through this meal, we make a radical declaration of equality and hospitality for all of God's children, no matter who they are. That is indeed a radical thing. Because it was on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, in like manner, he took the cup and he said, drink of this cup, all of you, for poured out in this cup is the new covenant in my blood and I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again with you until we drink it new in God's new earth under God's new heaven. So I invite you to take a piece of your bread or whatever, dip it into the cup, knowing that we are all dipping into the same cup with each other. We are all the same, and we eat together. So now the worship service is almost completed. We're just going to have a few moments for announcements. Um, First announcement is that we will have a community, uh, worship community Zoom meeting uh, 10 minutes after we stop uh, this worship service. So uh, you should have received that link uh, in your email. Uh, Please click on that and join the Zoom meeting uh, 10 minutes after we uh, conclude this online worship service. Uh, Also, um, announcement this coming week, in addition to the um, program, so Patchwork is already doing our food pantry on Wednesdays and Thursdays. We're already doing some uh, virtual arts and smarts programming uh, started this past week. Uh, This coming week, we're going to start doing hospitality and health ministry again. Again, it's going to be very limited uh, with um, masks and as much distancing as we can do. We're going to be doing it outdoors, not inside the building, uh, to be as safe as possible. But we will have hospitality on Wednesday and Thursday mornings. uh, And I will be here as the health minister, as Nurse John, uh, to do what I'm able to do in a safe and healthy way uh, to try to support the health of our neighbors and our community. So um, please, uh, if... <clears throat> uh, support us, uh, pray for us. Uh, if, if you're able to volunteer and not be uh, in the way and, and have it all worked out, then, then come and do that. But please uh, check with us before you just show up if you're wanting to volunteer. 
Um, also, if you just want to stop by and say hi, again, from a uh, safe distance, uh, that would also be welcome. So um, any other announcements? I'm not seeing any. All right. So I believe that concludes our worship service for this evening. Thank you so much for participating. As I said before, if you want to keep up the participation after I sign off, I welcome that. If you have questions uh, about patchwork or about what I've said in, uh, in my comments tonight, uh, questions, comments, disagreements, whatever, uh, please keep the conversation going and key, please keep the participation going. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. And all of God's children said... Amen.